I'm an 18 year old male who lives in a small city. It was not famous at all. I mean, nothing was happening there until I decided to play around with the Ouija board with my friends. It was a normal boring day at school where everyone seems like they have zero reasons to live. I mean, what can I say? It's deadly boring in this town. One of my friends was watching videos of Ouija boards, how people suddenly went crazy or got possessed. Basically, he was watching some horrifying experience with Ouija boards. He gave us an excited look, like he had us the best idea in his whole life. And he told us he wanted to try out the Ouija board. I had no intention to even go closer to a possessed piece of wood. But everyone is excited about it, so I told myself, what's the worst thing that can happen? I regretted so bad what I said. So we decided to go and find the creepiest place that we can find around our city. It didn't take us long until we find it. We found a creepy old abandoned building. Looked like a hospital or something. But let's say it was a hospital. We were exploring the place. Everything was destroyed. We found some red liquid looked like blood, but I think it's just some red paint on the floor. It had a strange smell, but we completely ignored it. We found our place already. It was a dark room with only one window in it. It was so dark that we needed a lighter to at least have something to glow in that dark room. We sat there all together. Later on, the Ouija board was ready to be used on the ground. Everything was basically set up. We were so excited for this that we started the game with simple questions. Is there anyone there? We waited about 30 seconds and no response at all. That's when my friend shouted, This isn't working, let's get the fuck out of here. At that moment, the planchette started moving towards yes. We all thought someone moved it, but none said a thing. Silence for 10 seconds, and then my friend asked, What's your name? Then it started moving again and spelled C-L-A-R-A, -A, Clara. Are you guys moving it? Everyone said no, and that's when I got kinda creeped out. Now we asked, How did you die? It spelled M-U-R-D-E-R-E-D. -E Damn, I said. Prove us that you really exist. A friend said that, and I gave him the look like, did you seriously ask that? But the lighter turned off, and one of my friends started screaming, and she got so scared she almost started crying. I was more scared of the way she screamed than the lighter turning off. We calmed her down and continued asking more questions. Nothing major happened anyway. Maybe one of our friends did it to scare everyone out. But that's when things started to get scary. We asked her to prove us one more time. At that moment, the door started closing itself slowly. Alright, fuck this. Goodbye, Clara. Said one of my friends. Then the planchette moved to goodbye. We all left the building. Everything was so strange. Everyone were just down for a reason. I felt like someone was watching me for the whole time. Once we left the building, something made me turn around and I looked directly to the window in the room that we were in. There was a girl watching me from up there. I directly shouted, Guys, up there, at the window, look! They all turned around, but the girl disappeared. I was so scared at this point of time that I decided to sleep at the friend's house. We went to his house. I still had this girl in my mind. Maybe that was Clara? I didn't tell my friend what exactly happened because I don't want to scare the shit out of him. So we decided to play some games on his PS4. Hours went by, it was 1am. And we were so tired from playing games and we went to bed. It was a peaceful night until I had the nightmare being in the same hospital. But this time, alone. I was looking around for something. I'm never gonna find out for what exactly. Then suddenly a door shuts behind me, I turn around, and there she was. The same girl, she was just staring at me. We stared at each other for quite some time now. And then somehow she just teleported straight into my face. I woke up instantly. Her face was so disordered. It's like someone actually had killed her with a baseball bat. As I said, I woke up, it was 3 am. I needed to take a piss so bad. I went to the toilet, did my business, and I heard someone was whispering my name from the kitchen. Being once again a dumbass teenager, I went there 
And there she was again, staring at me for no reason. I asked her, What the fuck do you want from me? She answered, Get out of here. Think about coming to the hospital again, or you will suffer the consequences from hell. Then she disappeared, and I blacked out. My friend's parents found me in the middle of the kitchen, then started asking questions of what exactly happened. I tried explaining to them, but the look of their faces, they thought I was joking. Five months passed, and nothing weird happened. I'm so glad it all ended. But until this day, I ask myself, why did you choose me instead of my other friends that were there? I will never find out. My family hasn't been closely knit, not for a very long time, particularly on my father's side. Until just the last few years, I hadn't seen any of my cousins or aunts or uncles from that side of the family since I was probably about 10 years old, almost 20 years ago. Over the last few years, however, my father has become heavily involved in researching our family's history. Out of that endeavor has sprung an annual family reunion, which we have had every year for the last two or three. I'd be lying if I said the first couple of times were anything short of awkward. As I said, I haven't seen any of them since I was a child. Now, as a grown adult, I was thrown back into the mix with family that I barely knew. In a few cases, I still can't even get their names straight, had nothing in common with, and nothing with which to talk about. My cousin Davey was probably the single exception to this, but even he was a completely different person from the kid I'd known, as was I to he, no doubt. So for the first two years, I mostly stuck with my immediate family, near the alcohol, and sat in uncomfortable silence. A few weeks ago, we had what I think was our third annual reunion. This time, probably in large part thanks to my recent pension for dragging up long forgotten memories from what has become a rather fuzzy childhood. And then sharing those recollections with you dear readers, I made a deliberate effort to establish communication with my cousin Dave. The alcohol may have played a small hand as well, who can say? This conversation turned out to be easy, satisfying, and much more enlightening than I could have hoped. We discussed shared childhood events, including those detailed in the dead children of Camp Redwood, ghouls in the graveyard, and eyes from beyond, as well as others. Several events came up over the course of this discussion and in the further discussions we've had in our continued communication since that I'd almost completely forgotten about. That is to say, that I had completely forgotten until he brought them up. Then. It all came flooding back. I'd like to share some of those stories with you here. This first story takes place around the time of my Camp Redwood story, in a house within which, as I look back now, I always felt unsafe. I don't know if I blocked out most of my memories from that house or what. What I do know is that I'd not thought of it in a very long time. But over the last few weeks, speaking with my cousin Dave has opened a floodgate of memories, some absolutely horrifying, as well as possibly having opened a floodgate of paranormal activity. The night on which the following events occurred started off as quiet. It was a summer evening in the turbulent era that followed my parents' divorce. My mother had gotten the house, a rather large old house which sat in a small thicket of woods in a fairly populous suburban area. The area was by no means remote, but by comparison to the others in the neighborhood, my house sort of was. My father was off in his new apartment, and my mother was constantly working into the wee hours of the morning, doing her best to support the family. My oldest sister was rarely home, and my other, also older sister, was living on her own with her boyfriend. 
That left my brother and I, both very young, alone in the house almost every night. On this occasion, being midsummer, we'd managed to round up some company. My cousin Dave and one of my brother's friends, named Jesse, had come over and were hanging out deciding what they wanted to do. Eventually, they decided they were going to walk up to our old neighborhood to see some friends, leaving me behind as my older brother didn't want me tagging along. So they left. I was alone a lot as a kid, but only in this particular house do I remember every feeling the need to round up an arsenal of weaponry with which to protect myself. I would empty virtually the entire contents of the silverware drawer onto the couch next to me. Forks, steak knives, butter knives, shish kebab skewers, with which I made wolverine claws. But all of this is neither here nor there. I'd gone about this same ritual on this very night and sat down with my wolverine claws prepared to watch some television. X-Files, I think, back when it was scary. Before long, the peaceful summer night turned into a raging storm. The rain beat on the roof like a stampede of infinite horses as the sound of distant thunder grew louder. The power started to flicker, threatening to throw me into a world of darkness, and I huddled closer to my stockpile of murderous butter knives. Suddenly there came a furious pounding on the front door. I was frightened, not knowing who could possibly be at the door, but at the same time the thought of being alone in the house scared me so much that I didn't care. I ran to the window, creeping up slowly as I neared it, in order not to be seen. I slipped the curtain aside carefully and looked through the window. It was pouring outside, however, and a sheet of rain roared across the glass, collecting here and there in thick rivulets so that I couldn't see anything outside. The darkness of the night and the surrounding trees did their part to impede my vision as well. Suddenly, a blinding flash of light illuminated the world outside, through the flowing water, I was able to make out the shape of two figures standing on my porch, crouched low to the ground. I watched as they swayed back and forth just outside the door. They looked like trolls or garden gnomes. The knocking came again, this time a bit angrier. Let us in, a voice growled from outside of the door. I clenched my wolverine claw-wielding fist. Matt, let me in or I'll kill you. It only took a moment for me to recognize my brother's voice and another moment to let him in the house, along with Dave and Jesse. In another moment still, I was being pelted with wet fist. Why didn't you open the door? They said. I, uh, I thought you were garden gnomes. Time ticked by with all of us sat inside the house, me happy to have some company and them unhappy to be back home. The power wavered once more, and even the older boys held their breath. The storm was vicious and showed no signs of letting up. Oh man, you guys, Dave said suddenly, jumping to his feet. I, I have a great idea. We all turned our attention towards him. Let's play with the Ouija board. Of course, as was almost always the case with Dave, this idea was both terribly bad yet well received. We all ran around in excitement, gathering up candles, blankets, pillows, and of course, the Ouija board. Allow me to set the stage a little before we get too far in. We'll be back on track shortly, but to add to the picture, as well as not to slow down the pacing later, I think it's important that we get it out of the way. When you first walked into the front door, there was a wide and open landing area just before the stairs that led up to the second floor. To the left, through a wide archway, was the dining room. Through the dining room on the right was the door to the long, narrow kitchen, which had a door on the left leading outside, and on the right a door down into the basement. Back at the main entrance, if you made a right, through another wide archway, you would enter the living room. As you entered, on your right was a large window, the one I'd looked out earlier in the story, in front of which sat the TV I'd been watching. On the left, across from the TV, was a long sofa, one of its three cushions supporting a pile of kitchen cutlery and eating utensils. 
Behind the sofa was a small area of the living room that was sort of sectioned off. It was about eight feet from the back of the couch to the back wall of the living room, where another large window looked out on the backyard. Also in this section, on the wall to the left, was a closet, which was where the Ouija board had been kept. It was in this little nook behind the couch, in front of the closet and below the backyard window, that we'd set up the board. We laid down a thick, comfy quilt and lined it with some pillows. Then we lit the candles around us in a crude circle before turning off the lights. With the thunder rumbling in the heavens, shaking the house upon its foundations, and the rain continuing its assault upon the roof, we began our session with the Ouija board. Due to limited finger space on the planchette, I was left out of the actual communication attempt and reduced to simply a spectator, but that was fine with me. I sat on my pillow, blanket wrapped about my shoulders, and watched as the others began their efforts to communicate with the dead. If there are any spirits here with us tonight, we'd like to try and speak with you," said my cousin Dave, with his fingertips gently caressing the white plastic planchette. Nothing happened. At first, for several minutes, similar statements were made and various questions were asked, all of which evoked no response from the spirit board. More minutes passed, and the excitement had begun to fade as still nothing appeared to be happening. I sensed the other's enthusiasm, beginning to falter and feared that the mood of the evening was about to be ruined. Suddenly, my brother's friend Jesse shouted at the top of his voice, Speak! At that moment, the planchette leapt into the air about three inches off of the board. I recall now that I could plainly see the space between the board and the plastic piece. It was clearly airborne. Dave was on my left and my brother on my right, with both of their fingers completely visible to me. Jesse sat across from me, however, with his back to the closet door. I couldn't see his fingers, and as he had been the one to shout, I was suspicious that he might have been behind the planchette's sudden burst of activity. I kept my mouth shut, however, in an effort to sustain the atmosphere. The others had reeled back in fright in response to the sudden movement. Eventually, with an abundance of hesitance, the three resumed their prior position. Is there someone here with us? Dave asked. The board did not respond. My brother looked towards Jesse. You try, he said. Jesse looked at him nervously, mouth agape, but without argument, he turned his face back towards the board, closing his slack jaw to swallow the lump in his throat. Is, is anyone here with us? Jesse asked. I watched in awe as the planchette slowly began to move, creeping along towards the top of the board, which was in front of my brother. Near the edge of the board, just before sliding off onto the quilt, it stopped. Through the circular window embedded into the white plastic, the word yes could be read. My brother's head quickly snapped up and looked towards Jesse with a dubious expression on his face, as if to say, you'd better not be doing this. In return, Jesse shook his head, a look of fright spread across his own face, as if to say, it's not me, I swear. Still, I had my suspicions, though the scared excitement had returned. Keep going, Dave said to Jesse. Uh, do, do you have a name? He asked. The plastic fang again began to creep along, shuffling across the board on its felt shoes. It only moved this time in a small circle before coming to rest once more on the word yes. Dave smirked. Smartass, he said. Well, Jesse began. What is? The planchette suddenly lurched across the board, stopping briefly on the letter U then slid off quickly to the letter N. Finally, at a pace much swifter than it had moved in answering the previous questions, it zipped over to the letter O. There, it came to rest. We all cast nervous glances at one another before the inevitable accusations began. Jesse, 
Come on, man, I know you're doing this, offered my brother. I threw my hat into the ring behind him, as I did agree. Jesse shook his head. No, man, I swear. All I know is that it isn't me, said Dave. So it's definitely one of you two. How come it's only answering to Jesse? Brandon, my brother, asked. Come on, Dave. He's got to be doing it. Dave looked towards Jesse. I, I swear, it's not me, guys. Jesse said, his voice cracking. He was visibly shaken. I, I don't know, dude, said Dave. Look at him. He's terrified. I am, Jesse admitted. I am terrified. I, I think we should stop. No way, the other three of us agreed in unison. So, after a timidly fought uphill battle against my brother and Dave, Jesse resumed communication. So, uh, your name is Uno? He asked. The planchette hurtled furiously across the board, again towards my brother, with such speed it caused him to rock backwards a bit. No, it responded. It then began another circuit of the board, racing hurriedly, angrily, from letter to letter, once more indicating the cryptic letters U-N-O. This time, it didn't stop, however. It continued on. U-N-O, racing back and forth repeatedly. U-N-O, hissing and scraping across the board. U-N-O. Outside, the storm raged, and the sky was torn open with a ferocious roar. Jesse could take no more. Stop it! He screamed at the top of his lungs. And to my astonishment, the planchette stopped, coming to rest upon the O, so that through the circular window, it appeared as an eyeball, staring us down maliciously. I felt suddenly very uneasy, now afraid that Jesse was in fact not behind this activity. He was either a very good actor, or something more was going on here. The others seemed to share my apprehension. I watched Dave and my brother communicate wordlessly, both coming to the agreement that maybe this had gone far enough. At least that's what I thought they'd agreed upon. They never got the chance to express it. As everyone sat around stunned, the planchette began to move once more at its original achingly slow pace. I watched as it slid out from under Jesse's fingers. Clearly, he was not the culprit. Seeing this, my brother then let go, followed by Dave. The planchette, however, kept moving. We looked on in disbelief watching the plastic fang move along of its own accord, aided not by human hands. The eye revealed to us the following letters. D-I-G. Again, it began a circuit of the board. D-I-G. 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 Jesse slammed his hand down upon the plastic plank, halting its movement then instantly yanked his hand away with a cry of pain. Wincing, and with tears beginning to stream down his face, he drew his hand to his mouth and sucked on the fingers. My hand, he shouted. It, it burned me. On the board, in between the four of us, the planchette began to bounce violently, back and forth from leg to leg at a rapid pace, making a sound like a spinning quarter beginning to falter. Outside, there came a tremendous boom, coupled with the searing light from an intense blast of lightning. On my right, just above eye level, the curtained window to the backyard was a lit, a bluish square of bright fuzzy light, casting shadows about the darkened room. In that moment of brief illumination, from the corner of my eye, I could see the figure of someone standing in the backyard, just outside the window. Dave, who sat with his back against the rear of the couch, facing the window, saw the image entirely. Holy shit, 
He sprang to his feet and vaulted over the couch behind him, while Jesse, who had also seen the figure, fell backwards into the corner of the couch and closet with a whimper, sucking on his burned fingers. Dave sped towards the lamp, just beside the couch, and hurriedly clicked it on, only it didn't come on. Now knowing that what I thought I'd seen from the corner of my eye had actually been there, I too jumped to my feet, ran around the couch and into the main area of the living room. What the heck, guys? Brandon shouted. He'd been seated with his back to the window and thus didn't see the figure standing outside in the storm, illuminated against the backdrop of night. I myself continued running through the living room, past Dave, still trying to click on the lamp and into the entry hall. There, I flipped the switch to the light in the entryway and the light in the dining room on my left, neither of which came on. Apparently, with the lights already off in order to enhance our candlelit session with the Ouija board, we'd miss the fact that the power had died. Oh my god, you guys. I said, peeking my head back into the living room. The, the power's out. As I looked into the living room to inform the others of our dilemma, the back window once more flared with that electrical glow. I was now completely facing the window and could see, clear as day, the woman standing in our backyard just outside the window. Her hair was done up nice and neat in a style similar to something from an old style TV show. She wore a white shirt or blouse with what appeared to be a blue apron over top. In that brief moment in which she was lit up, I couldn't make out her facial features through the rain streaked window. Her face instead appeared all smeared and blurry. Oh my God. I said again, pointing with a trembling hand towards the window. At the same time, I could hear a whimper come from behind the couch, one that I was sure had been issued from Jesse's finger sucking lips. Now standing upright, my brother took notice of my indication of the rear window and finally turned to see what all the fuss was about. Though I could no longer see the woman from where I was, Brandon, being much closer to the window, apparently could. For when he turned to see what it was that I was pointing at, with such a look of terror spread across my face, he immediately jumped to his right, away from the window, with a surprised shriek. Oh crap! Oh crap! He shouted as he tore towards me through the living room. Who is that? Don't leave me! Jesse screamed from behind the couch. Get up, you idiot! Dave yelled as he made his way into the entry hall with my brother and I. Quick, my brother said, suddenly, we have to lock the doors. Instantly, I jumped towards the front door and slammed on the bolt. Brandon took off through the dining room and into the kitchen to lock the door out to the side yard, tripping and knocking over chairs along the way. Dave had run back into the living room to grab a couple of the candles and was shouting for Jesse to follow. He'd finally come out from behind the couch, shaking and in tears. After a few moments passed and my brother had not come back, the other three of us left the entryway and headed towards the kitchen to find him and see what was going on. There we found Brandon, leaning over the sink, above which was a small pair of windows looking out into the backyard. In his hand was a flashlight turned off, which he had apparently acquired from the kitchen junk drawer. We all gathered in the long, narrow kitchen and waited silently for him to report what he saw outside. I don't see anything out there, guys, he said after a few moments of gazing through the glass. I know I saw her, I said. Her? asked Dave. Yeah, her, replied my brother. I saw her too. He turned and looked back out the window, but I, I don't see her now. We stayed in the kitchen, huddled closely together, shadows shifting with the dancing candlelight, just waiting, waiting for something to happen, anything 
for the power to come on, for my mother to come home, unlikely not for a few more hours, or maybe for one of my sisters to pay a visit. None of those things happened. Instead, just barely audible over the rain drumming across the roof and the continuous rumble of thunder, we heard a long, drawn out, squeaky whine like that of a rusty hinge coming from somewhere outside. It was followed shortly by a loud metallic bang. What the heck was that? Dave asked. I don't know. My brother answered him. Oh God, you guys, Jesse groaned. This this isn't right. It's all wrong. Yeah, guys, I don't like this. I said, voicing my concerns. There was a feeling of impending doom that was slowly building, gaining momentum, spreading like a disease through the air, infecting us. We all could feel it. A creeping fear stronger than that by which each and every one of us had already been seized. We weren't in the clear. Something more was about to happen. From below our feet, there arose a clatter accompanied by another metallic boom. Oh, no, my brother said. What? What? What is it? I asked. The storm cellar, he replied. We had forgotten about the storm cellar, a pair of green metal doors which sat just outside into the left of the living room window at which the woman had been standing and led downward into the basement. On my right, standing nearly ajar, was the door that led from our kitchen down into the dank, dark cellar. W was it open? Dave asked nervously. We have to lock it, he said, without waiting for a reply. Impulsively, Dave pushed his way by me, snatched the flashlight from Brandon's hand, and headed for the basement door. No, my brother and I both yelled, knowing that in all likelihood it was already too late to secure the basement. Dave flicked on the torch, swung open the door, and aimed the beam of light into the passage, then froze, staring open-mouthed into the darkness at something down the basement stairs. My brother jumped forward, knocking Jesse to the ground, clutched Dave by the shoulders, and yanked him away from the top of the steps. The sudden action caused Dave to drop the flashlight, which came to rest at the top of the stairs. As my brother pulled Dave away, I sprang towards the door to shut it. At my feet, the dropped flashlight, still emitting its beam, pointed straight ahead into the pitch black of the cellar. I couldn't help but look. Directly ahead, the light refracted off of the steeply descending ceiling, illuminating faintly the damp wooden stairs below. At the bottom of the basement stairs, in a black puddle of trembling water, stood the woman. Water rolled off of her wet skin and soaked clothes, falling into the black puddle to cause ripples that sped away towards the puddle's edge in circles of reflected light. It was hypnotic. I watched in horror as the woman slowly leaned forward, farther and farther, until her face was little more than a foot away from the stairs. No human being could possibly lean forward at such a dramatic angle. In a twitchy and spastic motion, the woman's head lifted so that she was staring directly at me. It was now her face that caught my attention, or rather the lack thereof. It was blank, blurry, and yet shifting as though I were still viewing it through a rainy window. The woman, still leaning forward, hovering parallel to the steps, then began to haltingly float upward towards me. The blue fabric from the apron she wore hung limp, dragging along the steps with a disquieting whisper. As she got closer, her feet, dragging behind her, thumped and scraped along with each and every step she passed, 
I could hear her toenails as they scratched slowly across the old warped wood. The dripping faceless woman crept towards me, getting closer by the second. Then, from out of the deeply shadowed cellar behind her, stepped two children standing side by side. On the left, a boy dressed in a suit stood up staring at me, with his hands perfectly straight on his sides. Next to him was a little girl of equal height, dressed like the woman who was now halfway up the stairs. The children's faces were grotesque, almost cartoonish. Eyes far too big for their heads bulged from their tiny sockets, while below, their mouths were stretched into impossibly wide, maniacal grins, exposing equally unlikely teeth. Their skin was a pale, frigid tint of blue. The children remained at the bottom, just outside of the shadows, while the mother continued her ascent. As the woman got closer, I vaguely remember thinking that I could faintly hear her humming a lazy tune. Matt, what are you doing? I heard my brother shout out on my right. Then suddenly, there was a clatter and the flashlight went spinning away, throwing the basement and the beings that occupied it back into unseen darkness. My brother had stepped in front of me, inadvertently kicking the flashlight in the process of taking me by the arm and pulling me away from the doorway. I recall feeling dazed. And now, as I write this, I suppose I must have been in some sort of trance. Throwing me out of the way, my brother spun back towards the door and slammed it shut. He then quickly slid the chain on the door into place, hopefully securing the basement. What did you guys see? Brandon asked, turning back towards Dave and I. Uh, a woman, Dave said. And kids, I added. Dave shot a quizzical look towards me. It hit me then what I'd just seen. Oh my God, Brandon, we have to get out of here. My brother seemed prepared to argue until with a final loud snap, the basement door popped open. Luckily, the chain held, and in that moment, the four of us scrambled over one another in a dash for the front door. On our way through the dining room, disoriented and shrouded in darkness, we clearly heard another loud snap, followed by the bang of the basement door crashing into the kitchen wall. The chain had given out. My brother, my cousin Dave, Jesse and I spilled out of the house into the pouring rain, the roaring thunder and the crackling lightning. We ran down our long wooded driveway out onto the street and then ran some more. We finally stopped running once we made it to a brightly lit intersection, an oasis in the dark of night, where a nearby gas station offered shelter from the storm and hopefully a chance to find help. From there, we called my sister, told her we had seen someone in the house, and asked her to pick us up, which she did. She took the four of us back to her apartment, and though we argued, knowing that we'd not just been victims of a family break-in, she called the police. They checked our house out, discovered signs of a possible break-in, but no perps. The only things they found to verify our story at all was water trailing from the storm cellar doors through the basement, up the steps, and to the basement door with the busted chain. However, they also encountered our Ouija board setup, which only helped to cast further doubt upon the reality of our story in the minds of the officers. The rest of that summer ticked by slowly, my brother and I taking it one day at a time, each of us unwilling to be left alone in that house. Eventually, though, once it was apparent that there would be no further activity, we were able to get back into a normal lifestyle. Nothing else of this magnitude ever happened in that house, and for years we had no answers. Was it a ghost we'd summoned through the Ouija board that was now set loose on the world? That was our best guess, 
but we had no clue until a few years later, that is. It turns out that Jesse had known the whole time who these spirits were, where they had come from, and what they wanted. He'd seen them before, you see, many times, his whole life, in fact. Now, we didn't know it at the time, and wouldn't find out until my brother entered middle school, but Jesse and his family were thought of around town as weirdos. They were thought of as outcasts. This was due entirely to Jesse's grandfather, who had once murdered a family in cold blood. A mother and her two children, a boy and a girl. The bodies had never been recovered. Jesse's grandfather had been tried and sentenced to death, but apparently, his punishment paled in comparison to what his family had gone through for years, constant torment from the unrestful spirits of the family slain by the grandfather's hands around town. It was just a story, one that the school kids told to scare each other and whispered about whenever Jesse walked down the hall, a family haunted for eternity by vengeful spirits. But when Dave and my brother first heard it, and then related it to me, we knew that it was no story. I never saw Jesse again. He kept his distance from my brother after that, and they rarely spoke again, if ever. According to Dave, Jesse and his family moved away a few years after the incident, no doubt taking the spirits with them. The bodies of the slain family, however, stayed behind, where they were eventually discovered buried on the property of Jesse's old house, a house that once belonged to his grandfather. I don't know for sure, but I think, I hope, that maybe two families finally found rest that day. This is a story about a group of friends who ditch school and go to check out a mysterious abandoned house nearby. A few weeks ago, some friends of mine from school died suddenly. Others went insane. The doctors tried to pass it all off as a mental illness. But I know the truth. They were possessed with something. When I was at school, I used to hang around with a group of boys in my class. There were five of us all together. Danny, Mitch, Eric, Mike, and myself. We never paid much attention to our schoolwork and spent our time ditching class and getting up to mischief. The teachers hardly even noticed our absence, and our parents never suspected a thing. One day, Danny and Mitch told the rest of us about a creepy urban legend they heard regarding the house that was near our school. The father of the family had gone insane and hung himself. When his wife and kids discovered the body, they were so dramatized. They couldn't stay in that home again. They just abandoned the house. We were so curious that we immediately decided to check it out. The next day, we all snuck out of school after lunch and we went to the house. When we got there, we were surprised to find out it was just a normal looking house. We would never have suspected that someone had committed suicide in that place. Danny and Mitch went in first and the rest of us followed close behind. We went into the kitchen and rummaged through the drawers and cupboards to see what was inside. There was nothing much of interest. Going upstairs we explored the bedrooms, but most of the furniture had been removed. Just then Eric noticed something in the hallway. There were two small windows at the very end. They were high up, almost touching the ceiling. It seemed strange because there was another room behind the windows, but no door to access it. Standing on each other's shoulders, we opened one of the windows 
and all of us managed to climb through. There was a musty smell in the air, its tank of damp and dry rot. The moldy wallpaper was peeling off the walls. It was empty except for a desk in the corner with a black box sitting on top of it. On the wall above it hung a large wooden cross. The strange thing was on the desk. The box in the cross had all painted completely black. Oh, I've got a bad feeling about this, said Danny as he walked over the desk and examined the box. Mitch was picking out the wallpaper. This place gives me the creeps, he said with a grimace. Danny flicked the latch on the black box, opened the lid and looked inside. I wonder what this is, he exclaimed. Just then, I happened to glance down at the floor. There was something carved into the wooden floorboards. It was some sort of a symbol covered an entire floor. A five-pointed star with a circle around it. I recognized that symbol. It was a pentagram. Mitch pulled a long, sticky sheet of the wallpaper off the wall. As he did so, it crumpled to the ground, revealing what was behind it. Underneath the paper, the wall was covered with inverted black crosses. Danny lifted shiny out of the box. It was a small golden chalice. There's something on it, he croaked. Some red liquid, I think it's blood. At that exact moment, the blood cross above the desk burst into flames. Everybody froze. We all started to freak out. Danny turned as white as a ghost. He was still holding the chalice with his trembling hands. His eyes rolled black and his hurt and the tongue hung out of his mouth as if he was choking. Mitch started screaming in terror and began climbing up the wall and crawled out of the window. I was right behind him, hoisting myself up and throwing myself through the narrow opening. I fell into the hallway on the other side, almost landing on top of Mitch. Mike managed to chamber out through the window as well, his eyes wide with fear. I could hear Danny's voice screaming under the side of the wall. Eric appeared at the window. He was clutching onto the edge with one hand while his other arm flayed widely. My leg! He cried. He's got my leg! I grabbed his arm, tried to put him out through. We could hear Danny in the room moaning and howling like a dog. Eric was in a blind panic, struggling and screaming for help. My leg! My leg! He kept screaming. We all pulled as hard we, as we could. Eric came thumping out the window, and we all fell in heap on the floor. He was shaking, crying, and whimpering. I looked down at his leg and was horrified to find there was a huge chunk missing of his calf. The flesh had been torn away from his bone. He bit me! Eric wailed pitifully. Call an ambulance, I shouted. Mike scrambled to his feet and ran to get help. Danny continued yelling and screaming into the other room. We were too scared to be on the window and check on him. We all exchanged frightened looks. I think he's possessed, said Mitch. We sat there on the dusty floor and waited, listening to the torture screams of Danny. He was like a wild animal, charging around like he's a crazed beast. He was uncontrollable, screaming, crying and bouncing around the room. Eventually, an ambulance arrived and the paramedics attended to Eric's wounds. The police came to and they saw the crazy state that Danny was in. They called for backup. The ambulance took Eric to the hospital. Our names and addresses were taken and we were driving home by two officers. We never saw Danny again. There was a rumor at school that his parents had to put him in a mental hospital. The police came and talked to our parents many times after that. They never told us what exactly they were discussing. Of course, we were all grounded for the rest of the year. In school, 
where we were on our best behavior, not wanting to get any more trouble, not wanting to get into, not wanting to get into any more trouble. One day, I was called to the principal's office. When I opened the door, I was shocked to see Mitch and Mike sitting in front of the principal's desk. Their faces were ashen. As soon as I closed the door behind me, the principal began speaking. Eric is dead, he announced. I couldn't believe it. Then I realized I haven't seen Eric for days. I thought he was just absent from school, and turned out he had collapsed and died from a heart attack. He was only 14 years old. The doctors couldn't explain it. Nobody could. Mitch and Mike and myself left the office that day with a heavy feeling in our hearts. We were the last surviving members of our group. We didn't speak to each other. There was absolutely nothing to say. The haunted expressions on our faces spoke volumes. After that, we all sort of drifted apart, as we can say. During the summer holidays, I happened to run into Mitch's sister at the mall. As soon as she set eyes on me, she broke down in tears. She told me that Mitch was dead and, and Mike had gone insane. Mitch hung himself in his bedroom. He told his parents he was going to bed and locked the door. He was found with his head shaved. His hair had been glued piece by piece to the ceiling. His eyes and mouth had been sewn shot with a needle and thread. Mike was found crawling down the street naked. He was laughing hysterically and grinding like a maniac. He couldn't close his eyes. When the permanent sedated him and brought him to the hospital, they discovered he had cut his own eyelids. At that moment, I knew that we are all cursed now. And I was the only one left. A few days later, I was stuck down by a mysterious illness. I had a fever and was confident to bed. All I could do was lay. I couldn't eat or drink anything. It felt as if something was crushing me, trying to turn me inside out. I was sure I was at death's door. The whites of my eyes turned black. I was in so much pain that I didn't care if I lived or died. I just wanted it to be over. One night, Danny came in my dream. He had withered away to nothing. All that was left was skin and bones. His skin was charred and blackened. And his eyes were completely white. Yeah, the last one, he whispered. Yeah, I replied. The only one who remembers what happened on that day, he said. I know, I replied. You should come here, he said. You belong with us. Uh, where are you? I asked nervously. You know where we are. <laughs> We're in hell. 